Chapter Four of Memoirs of Madame Vigi Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigi Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigi Le Bon, translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter Four, Exile. The same year that I went to Flanders, I made a stay of some length at Rainsy. The Duc d'Orléans, the father of Philippe Égalité, who was then living there, sent for me to paint his portrait and Madame de Montesson's. I cannot recall a certain incident without laughing, though it annoyed me considerably at the time. During Madame de Montesson's sittings, the old Princess de Conti came to see her one day and this princess persisted in addressing me as Miss. It is true that it had formerly been the custom for great ladies to behave in this way toward their inferiors, but that sort of court snobbery had gone out with Louis the Fifteenth. Another noted country estate, Genevier, belonged to the Comte de Vaudreuil, one of the most amiable of men. The Comte de Vaudreuil had bought this property largely for his highness, the Comte d'Artois, because it included fine hunting grounds. The purchaser had done much to embellish the place. The house was furnished in the best taste and without ostentation. There was a small but charming theatre in the house, where my sister-in-law, my brother, Monsieur de Riviere, and I often played in comic operas with Madame du Gazon and Garat, Caillou and La Rouette. The Comte d'Artois and his company witnessed our performances. The last given in the theatre at Genevier was The Marriage of Figaro by the actors of the Comédie Francois. Mademoiselle Contat was delightful in the part of Suzanne. Dialogue, couplets, and all the rest were aimed against the court, of which a large part was present. This extravagance benefited no one, but Beaumarchais was nonetheless intoxicated with joy. As there were complaints of the heat, he allowed no time for the windows to be opened, but smashed all the panes with his walking stick. The Comte de Vaudreuil came to repent of having given his patronage to the marriage of Figaro. In fact, very soon after the performance mentioned, Beaumarchais asked for an audience. This being at once granted, he arrived at Versailles at such an early hour that the Count had only just got up. The dramatist then broached a financial project which he had hatched out, and which was to bring in a vast fortune. He concluded by proposing to hand over to Monsieur de Vaudreuil a large sum if he would engage to carry the affair through successfully. The Count listened quite calmly, and when Beaumarchais finished speaking, answered, Monsieur de Beaumarchais, you could not come at a more favorable time, for I have spent a good night my digestion is in good order, and I never felt better than I do today. If you had made such a proposition to me yesterday, I would have thrown you out of the window. Another fine country place I visited was Villette. The Marquis de Villette, nicknamed Lovely and Lovable, having invited me, I went to pass a few days there. On one occasion we found a man painting fences in the park. This painter was working with such expedition that Monsieur de Villette complimented him upon it. Oh, was the reply, I'd undertake to cover up in a day all that Rubens painted in his whole life. I dined several times at saint Owen with the Duc de Nivernay, who owned a very handsome residence there, and who gathered about him the most agreeable company it was possible to meet. The Duke, always praised for his elegant and pointed wit, had manners that were dignified and gentle and without the slightest affectation. He was particularly distinguished for his extreme civility to women of all ages. In this respect, I might speak of him as a model of whom I would never have found a copy if I had not known the Comte de Vaudreuil, who, much younger than the Duc de Nivernay, added to his refined gallantry a politeness that was the more flattering since it came from the heart. In fact, it is very difficult to convey an idea today of the urbanity the graceful ease, in a word, the affability of manner which made the charm of Parisian society forty years ago. The women reigned then. 
the revolution dethroned them the duc de nivernay was very small and very lean although very old when i knew him he was still full of life he was passionately fond of poetry and wrote charming verses i also dined frequently at the marshal de noyers in his fine mansion situated at the entrance to saint germain there was then an immense park there admirably kept the marshal was highly sociable his cleverness and good spirits infected all his guests whom he selected from among the literary celebrities and the most distinguished people of the town and the court it was in seventeen eighty six that i went for the first time to louversion where i had promised to paint madame du barry she might then have been about forty-five years old she was tall without being too much so she had a certain roundness her throat being rather pronounced but very beautiful her face was still attractive her features were regular and graceful her hair was ashy and curly like a child's but her complexion was beginning to fade she received me with much courtesy and seemed to me very well behaved but i found her more spontaneous in mind than in manner her glance was that of a coquette for her long eyes were never quite open and her pronunciation had something childish which no longer suited her age she lodged me in a part of the building where i was greatly put out by the continual noise under my room was a gallery sadly neglected in which busts vases columns the rarest marbles and a quantity of other valuable articles were displayed without system or order these remains of luxury contrasted with the simplicity adopted by the mistress of the house with her dress and her mode of life summer and winter madame du barry wore only a dressing robe of cotton cambric or white muslin and every day whatever the weather might be she walked in her park or outside of it without ever incurring disastrous consequences so sturdy had her health become through her life in the country she had maintained no relations with the numerous court that surrounded her so long in the evening we were usually alone at the fireside madame du barry and i she sometimes talked to me about louis the fifteenth and his court she showed herself a worthy person by her actions as well as her words and did a great deal of good at louversien where she helped all the poor every day after dinner we took coffee in the pavilion which was so famous for its rich and tasteful decorations the first time madame du barry showed it to me she said it is here that louis the fifteenth did me the honor of coming to dinner there was a gallery above for musicians and singers who performed during the meal when madame du barry went to england before the terror to get back her stolen diamonds which in fact she recovered there the english received her very well they did all they could to prevent her from returning to france but it was not long before she succumbed to the fate in store for everybody who had some possessions she was informed against and betrayed by a little negro called zamore who was mentioned in all the memoirs of the period as having been overwhelmed with kindness by her and louis the fifteenth being arrested and thrown into prison madame de berry was tried and condemned to death by the revolutionary tribunal at the end of seventeen ninety three she was the only woman among all who perished in those dreadful days unable to face the scaffold with firmness she screamed she sued for pardon to the hideous mob surrounding her and that mob became moved to such a degree that the executioner hastened to finish his task this has always confirmed my belief that if the victims of that period of execrable memory had not had the noble pride of dying with fortitude the terror would have ceased long before it did i made three portraits of madame du barry in the first i painted her at half length in a dressing gown and straw hat in the second she is dressed in white satin she holds a wreath in one hand and one of her arms is leaning on a pedestal the third portrait i made of madame du barry is in my own possession i began it about the middle of september seventeen eighty nine from louvet sien we could hear shooting in the distance and i remember the poor woman saying if louis the fifteenth were alive i am sure this would not be happening i had done the head and outlined the body and arms when i was obliged to make an expedition to paris 
i hope to be able to return to louveciennes to finish my work but heard that berthier and foulon had been murdered i was now frightened beyond measure and thenceforth thought of nothing but leaving france the fearful year seventeen eighty nine was well advanced and all decent people were already seized with terror i remember perfectly that one evening when i had gathered some friends about me for a concert most of the arrivals came into the room with looks of consternation they had been walking at longchamp that morning and the populace assembled at the Etoile gate had cursed at those who passed in carriages in a dreadful manner some of the wretches had clambered on the carriage steps shouting next year you will be behind your carriages and we shall be inside and a thousand other insults as for myself i had little need to learn fresh details in order to foresee what horrors impended i knew beyond doubt that my house in the rue gros chenet where i had settled but three months since had been singled out by the criminals they threw sulphur into our cellars through the air holes if i happened to be at my window vulgar ruffians would shake their fists at me numberless sinister rumors reached me from every side in fact i now lived in a state of continual anxiety and sadness my health became sensibly affected and two of my best friends the architect brognard and his wife when they came to see me found me so thin and so changed that they besought me to come and spend a few days with them which invitation i thankfully accepted brognard had his lodgings at the invalides whither i was conducted by a physician attached to the palais royal whose servants wore the orleans livery the only one then held in any respect there i was given everything of the best as i was unable to eat i was nourished on excellent burgundy wine and soup and madame brognard was in constant attendance upon me all this solicitude ought to have quieted me especially as my friends took a less black view of things than i did nevertheless they did not succeed in banishing my evil forebodings what is the use of living what is the use of taking care of oneself i would often ask my good friends for the fears that the future held over me made life distasteful to me but i must acknowledge that even with the furthest stretch of my imagination i guessed only at a fraction of the crimes that were to be committed i remember having supped at the brognards with his excellence monsieur de sombrule at that time governor of the invalides he brought us the news that an attempt was threatening to take the arms that he had in reserve but he added i have hidden them so well that i defy any one to find them the good man did not consider that one could trust no one but oneself as the arms were very soon abstracted it seems evident that he was betrayed by some of the servants in his employ monsieur de sombrul as notable for his private virtues as for his military talents was among the prisoners who were to be killed in their cells on the second of september the murderers gave him his life at the tears of supplication of his heroic daughter but villainous even in granting pardon they compelled mademoiselle de sombrul to drink a glass of the blood that flowed in streams in front of the prison for a long time afterward the sight of anything with red color made this unfortunate young woman vomit horribly some years later in seventeen ninety four monsieur de sombrul was sent to the scaffold by the revolutionary tribunal i had made up my mind to leave france for some years i had cherished the desire to go to rome the large number of portraits i had engaged to paint had however hindered me from putting my plan into execution but i could now paint no longer my broken spirit bruised with so many horrors shut itself entirely to my art besides dreadful slanders were pouring upon my friends my acquaintances and myself although heaven knows i had never hurt a living soul i thought like the man who said i am accused of having stolen the towers of notre dame they are still in their usual place but i am going away as i am evidently to blame i left several portraits i had begun among them mademoiselle contat's at the same time i refused to paint mademoiselle de la borde afterward duchess de noyers 
brought to me by her father she was scarcely sixteen and very charming but it was no longer a question of success or money it was only a question of saving one's head i had my carriage loaded and my passport ready so that i might leave next day with my daughter and her governess when a crowd of national guardsmen burst into my room with their muskets most of them were drunk and shabby and had terrible faces a few of them came up to me and told me in the coarsest language that i must not go but that i must remain i answered that since everybody had been called upon to enjoy his liberty i intended to make use of mine they would barely listen to me and kept on repeating you will not go citizeness you will not go finally they went away i was plunged into a state of cruel anxiety when i saw two of them return but they did not frighten me although they belonged to the gang so quickly did i recognize that they wished me no harm madame said one of them we are your neighbors and we have come to advise you to leave and as soon as possible you cannot live here you are changed so much that we feel sorry for you but do not go in your carriage go in the stagecoach it is much safer i thanked them with all my heart and followed their good advice i had three places reserved as i still wanted to take my daughter who was then five or six years old but was unable to secure them until a fortnight later because all who exiled themselves chose the stagecoach like myself at last came the long expected day it was the fifth of october and the king and queen were conducted from versailles to paris surrounded by pikes the events of that day filled me with uneasiness as to the fate of their majesties and that of all decent people so that i was dragged to the stagecoach at midnight in a dreadful state of mind i was very much afraid of the faubourg saint antoine which i was obliged to traverse to reach the barrier du trône my brother and my husband escorted me as far as this gate without leaving the door of the coach for a moment but the suburb that i was so frightened of was perfectly quiet all its inhabitants the workmen and the rest had been to versailles after the royal family and fatigue kept them all in bed opposite me in the coach was a very filthy man who stunk like the plague and told me quite simply that he had stolen watches and other things luckily he saw nothing about me to tempt him for i was only taking a small amount of clothing and eighty louis for my journey i had left my principal effects and my jewels in paris and the fruit of my labors was in the hands of my husband who spent it all i lived abroad solely on the proceeds of my painting not satisfied with relating his fine exploits to us the thief talked incessantly of stringing up such and such people on lamp-posts naming a number of my own acquaintances my daughter thought this man very wicked he frightened her and this gave me the courage to say i beg you sir not to talk of killing before this child that silenced him and he ended by playing at battle with my daughter on the bench i occupied there also sat a mad jacobin from grenoble about fifty years old with an ugly bilious complexion who each time we stopped at an inn for dinner or supper made violent speeches of the most fearful kind at all of the towns a crowd of people stopped the coach to learn the news from paris our jacobin would then exclaim everything is going well children we have the baker and his wife safe in paris a constitution will be drawn up they will be forced to accept it and then it will be all over there were plenty of ninnies and flatheads who believed this man as if he had been an oracle all this made my journey a very melancholy one i had no further fears for myself but i feared greatly for everybody else for my mother for my brother and for my friends i also had the gravest apprehensions concerning their majesties for all along the route nearly as far as lyon men on horseback rode up to the coach to tell us that the king and queen had been killed and that paris was on fire my poor little girl got all a-tremble she thought she saw her father dead and our house burned down and no sooner had i succeeded in reassuring her 
Then another horseman appeared and told us the same stories. I cannot describe the emotions I felt in passing over the Bouvazine Bridge. Then only did I breathe freely. I had left France behind, that France which nevertheless was the land of my birth and which i reproached myself with quitting with so much satisfaction the sight of the mountains however distracted me from all my sad thoughts i had never seen high mountains before those of the savoy seemed to touch the sky and seemed to mingle with it in a thick vapour my first sensation was that of fear but i unconsciously accustomed myself to the spectacle and ended by admiring it a certain part of the road completely entranced me i seemed to see the gallery of the titans and i have always called it so since wishing to enjoy all these beauties as fully as possible i got down from the coach but after walking some way i was seized with a great fright for there were explosions being made with gunpowder which had the effect of a thousand cannon shots and the din echoing from rock to rock was truly infernal I went up Mount Cenis, as other strangers were doing, when a postillion approached me, saying, The lady ought to take a mule. To climb up on foot is too fatiguing. I answered that I was a workwoman and quite accustomed to walking. Oh, no, was the laughing reply. The lady is no workwoman. We know who she is. Well, who am I, then? I asked him. You are Madame Lebrun, who paints so well and we are all very glad to see you safe from those bad people. I never guessed how the man could have learned my name, but it proved to me how many secret agents the Jacobins must have had. Happily, I had no occasion to fear them any longer. No sooner had I arrived at Rome than I did a portrait of myself for the Florence Gallery. I painted myself palette in hand before a canvas on which I was tracing a figure of the Queen in white crayon. After that I painted Miss Pitt, who was sixteen and extremely pretty. I represented her as Hebba on some clouds, holding in her hand a goblet from which an eagle was about to drink. I did the eagle from life, and I thought he would eat me. He belonged to Cardinal de Bernis. The wretched beast, accustomed to being in the open air, for he was kept on a chain in the courtyard, was so enraged at finding himself in my room that he tried to fly at me. I admit that I was dreadfully frightened. About this time I painted the portrait of a Polish lady, the Countess Potaka. She came with her husband, and after he had gone away she said to me quite coolly, He is my third husband, but I am thinking of taking back my first, who would suit me better, although he is a drunkard. I painted this pole in a very picturesque way. For a background she had a rock overgrown with moss, and falling water nearby. The pleasure of living in Rome was the only thing that consoled me for having left my country, my family, and so many friends I loved. My work did not deprive me of the daily diversion of going about the city and its surroundings. I always went alone to the palaces where collections of pictures and statues were exhibited, so as not to have my enjoyment spoiled by stupid remarks or questions. All these palaces are open to strangers, and much gratitude is due to the great Roman nobles for being so obliging. It may seem hard to believe, but it is true that one might spend one's whole life in the palaces and churches. In the churches are to be found great treasures of painting and extraordinary monuments. The wealth of St. Peter's in this respect is well known. The finest of the churches regarding architecture is St. Paul's, whose interior is lined with columns on each side. One can have no idea of the grand and imposing effect of the Catholic religion unless one can see Rome during Lent. On Easter Day I took good care to be in the square of St. Peter's, to see the Pope give his blessing. Nothing could have been more solemn. The immense square was filled at early morning by peasants and by the inhabitants of the town, in all sorts of different costumes, bright and varied in color, and there were also a large number of pilgrims. They all stood as still as the superb obelisk of oriental granite in the middle of the square. At ten o'clock the Pope arrived, clothed all in white, his crown on his head. 
he took his place in the center stand outside the church on a magnificent high velvet throne the cardinals surrounded him clad in their handsome dress it must be said that pope pius the sixth was splendid his healthy face showed no sign of the wear and tear of old age his hands were white and plump he knelt down to read his prayer afterward rising up he gave a double blessing in speaking these words urbi et orbi then as if struck by an electric shock the people the strangers the troops and all others fell on their knees while the cannons boomed from all sides this adding to the majesty of the scene by which it was impossible not to be moved the blessing given the cardinals threw a quantity of papers down from the gallery and these i was told were indulgences thousands of hands shot upward to grasp them the eagerness and the excitement of this crowd its pressing and pushing were beyond description when the pope withdrew the regimental bands intoned a flourish and the troops then marched off to the rattle of drums in the evening the dome of st peter's was illuminated first with lights under colored glasses and then with white lights of great brilliancy it was difficult to conceive how the change could be effected with such rapidity however the spectacle was as beautiful as it was remarkable the same evening two gorgeous fireworks were set off at the castle of st angelo myriads of bombs and fire balloons were sent into the air the final display was the most magnificent to be seen of the kind and the reflection of these splendid fireworks in the tiber doubled their effect in rome where everything is grand the great mansions have no wretched lamps before them but each palace is provided with enormous candelabras from which stream gigantic flames that shed day so to speak over the whole city this luxurious manner of lighting strikes a stranger the more as the streets of rome are mostly illuminated by the lamps burning in front of the madonnas strangers are attracted to rome far more by holy week than by the carnival at which i was not surprised the masqueraders establish themselves in tears disguised as harlequins as pulcinellos etc just as we see them on the boulevards in paris the difference being that in rome they never stir i saw only a single young man going about the streets after the french fashion he was giving a lifelike imitation of a very affected exquisite whom we had no difficulty in recognizing the carriages and wagons come and go full of richly costumed people the horses are adorned with feathers ribbons and bells the servants being dressed up as scaramouche or harlequin but it all passes off in the quietest way in the world finally toward evening several discharges of cannon announce the horse races which enliven the rest of the day there is no town in the world where one could pass one's time as delightfully as in rome even were one deprived of all the resources which good society offers the walks within the walls are a joy for one is never tired of revisiting the Colosseum, the Capitol, the Pantheon, the Square of St. Peter's with its colonnades, its superb obelisk, and its lovely fountains, across which the rays of the sun often throw beautiful rainbows. The square is wonderfully impressive at sunset and in the moonlight. Whether it was on my way or not, I always took pleasure in crossing it. What astonished me very much in Rome was to find at the Colosseum on Sunday mornings a crowd of women from the lowest classes, extravagantly bedizened and loaded with ornaments, and wearing in their ears enormous stars of paste diamonds. It was also in this garb that they went to church, frequently followed by a domestic, who very often was no other than their husband, his real occupation being probably that of a valet these women do nothing at home their idleness is such that they live in the greatest want they may be seen at their windows in the streets of rome with flowers and feathers on their head their faces made up with cosmetics the upper part of their dress which is visible indicates great luxury so that one is surprised upon entering their rooms to find that they have on nothing more than a dirty petticoat the roman dames whom i mention 
nevertheless enact aristocratic parts and when the time comes to go to the villas they carefully close their shutters in order to create the belief that they have left for the country i was assured that every woman in rome was in the habit of carrying a dagger i do not however believe that the great ladies wear any but certain it is that the wife of denis the landscape painter with whom i lodged and who was a roman showed me the dagger which she always had about her as for the men of the people they are never unprovided with one and this brings about a number of grave tragedies three evenings after my arrival for instance i heard in my street some shouts followed by a great tumult i sent out to learn what the matter was and was informed that a man had just killed another with his dagger as these peculiar habits made me very much afraid i was assured that strangers had nothing to fear that it was simply a question of an act of revenge between italians as for the case in point the murderer and his victim had quarrelled ten years ago and the first having recognized his enemy at once struck him down with his dagger which proves how long an italian can keep a grudge certainly the customs of the upper class are milder since high society is very much the same all over europe however i am not the best judge as with the exception of relations involving my art and invitations sent to me for numerous parties i had little occasion to become acquainted with the patrician ladies of rome what happened to me was what naturally happens to every exile which was to seek the company of my own countrymen in seventeen eighty nine and seventeen ninety rome was full of french refugees whom i knew for the greater part and with whom i soon made friends we saw the princess joseph de monaco and the duchess de fleury arrive and a host of other notabilities the princess joseph de monaco had a charming face and was very sweet and charming unfortunately for her she did not stay in rome she returned to paris to attend to the small amount of property remaining to her children and she was there during the terror thrown into prison and condemned to death she was taken to the scaffold the arrival at rome of so many people bringing so much news made me undergo different emotions every day often they were very sad but sometimes very sweet i was told for instance that a little while after my departure when the king was begged to have his picture painted he had replied no i shall wait for madame lebrun to come back so that she may make a portrait of me to match the queen's i want her to paint me at full figure in the act of commanding monsieur de la perouse to make a journey round the world end of chapter four recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Five of Memoirs of Madame Vigilabon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigilabon by Elizabeth Louise Vigilabon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter Five, Neapolitan Days i had been in rome eight months or thereabouts when observing that all foreigners were leaving for naples i was seized with a great desire to go there likewise i confided my plan to the cardinal de berny who while approving advised me not to go alone he spoke to me of a monsieur du vivier the husband of voltaire's niece madame denis who proposed to make the journey and who would be charmed by my company monsieur du vivier came to me repeating everything that the cardinal had said and promising to take care of my daughter and myself he added thus tempting me the more that he had in his carriage a sort of stove for cooking fowl which would be very useful to us seeing how bad the fare was in the best ends of terracina all his offers suited me to a marvel and so i started with this gentleman his coach was very large my daughter and her governess sat in front and there was another seat in the middle a huge manservant sat on it in front of me in such a way that his large back touched me 
and I had to hold my nose. I am not in the habit of talking while traveling, so that conversation between us was restricted to the exchange of a few phrases. But as we were crossing the Pontine marshes, I noticed on the edge of a canal a shepherd whose flock was passing into a meadow all studded with flowers, and beyond which the sea and Cape Circe were visible. "'What a charming picture,' said I to my traveling companion. "'This shepherd, these sheep, the meadow, the sea.' those sheep are all filthy he answered you ought to see them in england farther along on the terracina road at the place where you cross a small river in a boat i saw at my left the line of the apennines crowned with magnificent clouds which the setting sun illumined i was unable to refrain from expressing my admiration aloud those clouds mean that we shall have rain tomorrow," said my optimistic friend we reached Naples at about three or four o'clock. I cannot describe the impression I received upon entering the town. That burning sun, that stretch of sea, those islands seen in the distance, that Vesuvius with a great column of smoke ascending from it, and the very population so animated and so noisy, who differ so much from the Roman that one might suppose they were a thousand miles apart. I had engaged a house at Chiaja, on the edge of the sea. Opposite me I had the island of Capri, and this situation delighted me. Hardly had I arrived when Count Skavronska, the Russian ambassador at Naples, whose house was next to mine, sent one of his runners to find out how I was, and at the same time had a very choice dinner brought me. I was the more grateful for this kind attention, as I must have died of hunger before there would have been time to get my kitchen ready. The same evening I went to thank the Count, and thus became acquainted with his charming wife. Count Skavronska had features that were noble and regular. He was very pale. His pallor came from the extreme delicacy of his health, which, however, did not prevent him from being highly sociable, nor from chatting both gracefully and cleverly. The Countess was as sweet and pretty as an angel. The famous Potemkin, her uncle, had loaded her with wealth, for which she had no use. Her great delight was to live stretched out on a lounge, wrapped in a large black cloak, and wearing no stays. Her mother-in-law sent her from Paris cases full of the most beautiful dresses then made by Mademoiselle Bertin, Queen Marie Antoinette's dressmaker. I do not believe that the Countess ever opened one of them and when her mother-in-law expressed a wish to see her in the beautiful gowns and headdresses contained in the cases, she answered indifferently, What for? Why? She gave me the same answer when showing me her jewel case, one of the most splendid I have ever seen. It contained enormous diamonds given her by Potemkin, but I never saw them on her. I remember her telling me that in order to go to sleep she had a slave under her bed who told her the same story every night. She was utterly idle all day. She had no education, and her conversation was quite empty. But in spite of all that, thanks to her lovely face and her angelic sweetness, she had an incomparable charm. Count Skavronska had made me promise to do his wife's portrait before anyone else's, and having agreed, I began this portrait two days after my arrival. After the first session, Sir William Hamilton, the British ambassador at Naples, came to me and begged that my first portrait in this town should be that of the splendid woman he presented to me. This was Madame Hart, who soon after became Lady Hamilton, and who was famous for her beauty. After the promise to my amiable neighbors, I could not begin the other portrait until Countess Skavronska's was well advanced. I then painted Madame Hart as a bacante reclining by the edge of the sea, holding a goblet in her hand. Her beautiful face had much animation, and was a complete contrast to the Countess's. She had a great quantity of fine chestnut hair, sufficient to cover her entirely, and thus, as a bacante with flying hair, she was admirable to behold. The life of Lady Hamilton is a romance. Her maiden name was Emma Lyon. Her mother, it is said, was a poor servant, and there is some disagreement as to her birthplace. At the age of thirteen she entered the service of an honest townsman of Hawarden as a nurse, 
but tired of the dull life she led and believing that she could obtain a more agreeable situation in london she betook herself thither the prince of wales told me that he had seen her at that time in wooden shoes at the stall of a fruit vendor and that although she was very meanly clad her pretty face attracted attention a shopkeeper took her into his service but she soon left him to become housemaid under a lady of decent family a very respectable person in her house she acquired a taste for novels and then for the play she studied the gestures and vocal inflections of the actors and rendered them with remarkable facility these talents neither of which pleased her mistress in the very least were the cause of her dismissal it was then that having heard of a tavern where painters were in the habit of meeting she conceived the idea of going there to look for employment her beauty was then at its height she was rescued from this pitfall by a strange chance dr graham took her to exhibit her at his house covered with a light veil as the goddess hygeia the goddess of health a number of curious people and amateurs went to see her and the painters were especially delighted some time after this exhibition a painter secured her as a model he made her pose in a thousand graceful attitudes which he reproduced on canvas she now perfected herself in this new sort of talent which made her famous nothing indeed was more remarkable than the ease lady hamilton acquired in spontaneously giving her features an expression of sorrow or of joy and of posing marvellously to represent different people her eyes a kindle her hair flying she showed you a bewitching bacante then all of a sudden her face expressed grief and you saw a magnificent repentant magdalene the day her husband presented her to me she insisted on my seeing her in a pose i was delighted but she was dressed in everyday clothes which gave me a shock i had gowns made for her such as i wore in order to paint in comfort and which consisted of a kind of loose tunic she also took some shawls to drape herself with which she understood very well and then was ready to render enough different positions and expressions to fill a whole picture gallery there is in fact a collection drawn by frederick reimberg which has been engraved to return to the romance of emma Lyon, it was while she was with the painter i have mentioned that lord greville fell so desperately in love with her that he intended to marry her when he suddenly lost his official place and was ruined he at once left for naples in the hope of obtaining help from his uncle hamilton and took emma with him so that she might plead his cause the uncle indeed consented to pay all his nephew's debts but also decided to marry emma Lyon in spite of his family's remonstrances lady hamilton became as great a lady as can be imagined it is asserted that the queen of naples was on an intimate footing with her certain it is that the queen saw her often politically might perhaps be said lady hamilton being a most indiscreet woman betrayed a number of little diplomatic secrets to the queen of which she made use to the advantage of her country lady hamilton was not at all clever though she was extremely supercilious and disdainful so much so that these two defects were conspicuous in all her conversation but she also possessed considerable craftiness of which she made use in order to bring about her marriage she wanted in style and dressed very badly when it was a question of everyday dress i remember that when i did my first picture of her as a sibyl she was living at caserta whither i went every day desiring to progress quickly with the picture the duchess de fleury and the princess de joseph monaco were present at the third sitting which was the last i had wound a scarf round her head in the shape of a turban one end hanging down in graceful folds this headdress so beautified her that the ladies declared she looked ravishing her husband having invited us all to dinner she went to her apartment to change and when she came back to meet us in the drawing-room her new costume which was a very ordinary one indeed had so altered her to her disadvantage that the two ladies had all the difficulty in the world in recognizing her 
When I went to London in 1802, Lady Hamilton had just lost her husband. I left a card for her, and she soon came to see me wearing deep mourning, with a dense black veil surrounding her, and she had had her splendid hair cut off to follow the new Titus fashion. I found this Andromaca enormous, for she had become terribly fat. She said that she was very much to be pitied, that in her husband she had lost a friend and a father, and that she would never be consoled. I confess that her grief made little impression upon me, since it seemed to me that she was playing a part. I was, evidently, not mistaken, because a few minutes later, having noticed some music lying on my piano, she took up a lively tune and began to sing it. As is well known, Lord Nelson had been in love with her at Naples. She had maintained a very tender correspondence with him. When I went to return her visit one morning, I found her radiant with joy, and besides, she had put a rose in her hair like Nina. I could not help asking her what the rose signified. It is because I have just received a letter from Lord Nelson, she answered. The Duke de Berry and the Duke de Bourbon, having heard of her poses, very much desired to witness a spectacle which she had never been willing to offer in London. I requested her to give me an evening for the two princes, and she consented. I also invited some other French people, who I was aware would be anxious to see this sight. On the day appointed, I placed in the middle of my drawing-room a very large frame, with a screen on either side of it. I had had a strong limelight prepared and disposed, so that it could not be seen, but which would light up Lady Hamilton as though she were a picture. All the invited guests having arrived, Lady Hamilton assumed various attitudes in this frame in a truly admirable way. She had brought a little girl with her, who might have been seven or eight years old, and who resembled her strikingly. One group they made together reminded me of Poussin's Rape of the Sabines. She changed from grief to joy and from joy to terror so rapidly and effectively that we were all enchanted. As I kept her for supper, the Duc de Bourbon, who sat next to me at table, called my attention to the quantity of porter she drank. I am sure she must have been used to it, for she was not tipsy after two or three bottles. Long after leaving London in 1815, I heard that Lady Hamilton had ended her days at Calais, dying there neglected and forsaken in the most awful poverty. The excursions I made at Naples did not prevent me from accomplishing a great deal of work. I even undertook so many portraits that my first stay in that town extended to six months. I had arrived with the intention of spending only six weeks. The French ambassador, the Baron de Talleyrand, came to inform me one morning that the Queen of Naples wished me to do the portraits of her two eldest daughters, and I began upon them at once. Her Majesty was preparing to leave for Vienna, where she was to busy herself about the marriage of these princesses. I remember her saying to me after her return, I have had a successful journey. I have just made two fortunate matches for my daughters. The eldest, in fact, soon after was married to the Emperor of Austria, Francis the Second, and the other, who was called Louise, to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. This second girl was very ugly, and made such grimaces that I did not want to finish her picture. She died a few years after her marriage. During the Queen's absence I also painted the Prince Royal. The hour of noon was appointed for the sittings, and in order to attend, I was obliged to follow the Chiaja road in the heat of the day. The houses on the left, which face the sea, being painted a lustrous white, the sun was reflected from them so vividly that I was almost struck blind. To save my eyes I put on a green veil which I had never seen anyone else do, and which must have looked rather peculiar, since only black or white veils were worn. But a few days after I saw several English women imitating me, and green veils came into fashion. I also found great comfort in my green veil at St. Petersburg, where the snow was so dazzling that it might have killed my eyesight. One of my greatest pleasures was to go for walks on the lovely slope of Posilipo. Under it is the grotto of the same name, which is a splendid piece of work a mile long, and which is recognized as having been done by the Romans. 
this slope of posilipo is covered with country houses casinos meadows and very fine trees with vines winding about them in festoons it is here that virgil's tomb is to be found and it is said that laurels grow upon it but i must confess that i saw none in the evenings i walked on the seashore i frequently took my daughter and we often remained sitting there together until moonrise enjoying the salubrious air and the gorgeous view this was a rest for my daughter after her daily studies for i had resolved to give her the best education possible and to this effect i had engaged at naples masters of writing geography italian english and german she showed a preference for german above the others and evinced a remarkable aptitude in her various studies there were some signs in her of a talent for painting but her favorite pastime was to compose novels returning from evening parties to which i had gone i would find her with a pen in her hand and another in her cap i would then oblige her to go to bed but not infrequently did she secretly get up in the middle of the night to finish one of her chapters and i remember very well how at the age of nine at vienna she wrote a little romance as remarkable for its situations as for its style all the portraits i'd engaged to do at naples being finished i went back to rome but hardly had i arrived when the queen of naples arrived also she making a stop there on her return journey from vienna as i happened to be in the crowd through which she made her way she noticed me and spoke to me and begged me with extreme graciousness to visit naples once more for the purpose of painting her portrait it was impossible to refuse and i complied with her wish at once upon arriving at naples i began the portrait of the queen forthwith it was then so terribly hot that one day when her majesty gave me a sitting we both fell asleep i took great pleasure in doing this picture the queen of naples without being as pretty as her younger sister the queen of france reminded me strongly of her her face was worn but one readily judged that she had been handsome her hands and arms especially were perfect in form and color this princess of whom so much evil has been written and spoken had an affectionate nature and simple ways at home her magnanimity was truly royal the marquis de bombellier the ambassador at vienna in seventeen ninety was the only french envoy who refused to swear to the constitution the queen being apprised that by this brave and noble conduct monsieur de bombellier the father of a large family had been reduced to the most unfortunate position wrote him a letter of commendation with her own hand she added that all sovereigns should be at one in acknowledging faithful subjects and asked him to accept a pension of twelve thousand francs she had a fine character and a good deal of wit she bore the burden of government alone the king would have nothing to do with it he spent most of his time at caserta before i left naples for good the queen presented me with a box of old lacquer with her initials surrounded by beautiful diamonds the initials are worth ten thousand francs i shall keep them all my life i had a burning desire to see venice i arrived there the day before ascension monsieur denon whom i had known in paris having heard of this came to see me without delay his cleverness and his great knowledge of the arts made him the most charming mentor and i congratulated myself upon such a happy encounter the very next day he took me out on the canal where the marriage of the doge with the sea was enacted the doge and all the members of the senate were on a vessel gilded inside and out and called the Bucentar. it was surrounded by a swarm of boats of which several were occupied by musicians the doge and the senators had on black gowns and white wigs with three bows when the Bucentar had reached the place fixed for the celebration of the marriage the doge pulled a ring from his finger and threw it into the sea at the same instant a thousand cannon shots announced to the city and its surroundings the consummation of this great wedding which concluded with mass a number of strangers were present at the ceremony 
i observed among them prince augustus of england and the charming princess joseph de monaco then preparing to go back to france for her children i saw her at venice for the last time end of chapter five recording by james k white chula vista chapter six of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by james k white chula vista memoirs of madame vigie le bon by elizabeth louise vigie le bon translated by lionel strachey chapter six turin and vienna meanwhile it being my desire to see france again i reached turin with this end in view the two aunts of louis the sixteenth had been kind enough to give me letters to clotilda queen of sardinia their niece they sent word that they very much wished to have a portrait done by me and consequently as soon as i was settled i presented myself before her majesty she received me very well after reading the letters of princess adelaide and princess victoria she told me that she regretted having to refuse her aunts but that having renounced the world altogether she must decline being painted what i saw indeed seemed quite in accord with her statement and her resolve the queen of sardinia had her hair cut short and wore on her head a little cap which like the rest of her garb was the simplest conceivable her leanness struck me particularly as i had seen her when she was very young before her marriage when her stoutness was so pronounced that she was called fat milady in france be it that this change was caused by too austere religious practices or by the sufferings which the misfortunes of her family had made her undergo the fact was that she had altered beyond recognition the king joined her in the room where she received me he was likewise so pale and thin that it was painful to look at them together i lost no time in going to see madame the wife of louis the eighteenth she not only accorded me a warm welcome but arranged picturesque drives for me in the neighbourhood of turin which i took with her lady-in-waiting madame de gourbillon and her son said surroundings are very beautiful but our first expedition was not very auspicious we set out in the heat of the day to visit a monastery situated high up on a mountain as the mountain was very steep we were obliged to get out of the carriage when we had gone half way and then climb on foot i remember passing a spring of the clearest water whose drops sparkled like diamonds and which peasants declare to be a cure for sundry diseases after climbing so long that we were exhausted we at length arrived at the monastery dying with heat and hunger the table was already laid for the monks and for travellers which filled us with joy since it may be imagined how impatient we were for dinner as there was some delay we thought that something special was being done for us seeing that madame had recommended us to the monks in a letter she had given us addressed to them at last a dish of frogs breasts was served which i took for a chicken stew but as soon as i tasted it i found it impossible to eat another morsel hungry as i was then three other dishes were brought on boiled fried and grilled and i set great hopes on each in turn alas they were only frogs again so we ate nothing but dry bread and drank water these monks never drinking nor offering wine my heart's desire was then an omelette but there were no eggs in the house after my visit to the monastery i met poor Parati, who wanted me to live with him he proposed occupying a farm he owned two miles from turin where he had some plain but comfortable rooms i gladly accepted this offer as i hated living in town and at once went to establish myself with my daughter and her governess in this retreat the farm stood in the open country surrounded with fields and little streams edged by trees high enough to form delightful bowers from morning till night i took rapturous walks in these enchanting solitudes 
my child enjoyed the pure air as much as i did the quiet peaceful life that we led alas it was in this peaceful place while i was in such a happy state of mind that i was struck a most cruel blow the cart which brought our letters having come one evening the carter handed me one from my friend monsieur de riviere my sister-in-law's brother who apprised me of the dreadful events of the tenth of august and supplied me with some horrible details i was quite overcome and made up my mind to go back to turin immediately on entering the town great heavens what did i behold streets squares were all filled with men and women of all ages who had fled from french towns and come to turin in search of a home they were coming in by thousands and the sight broke my heart most of them brought neither baggage nor money nor even food for they had had no time to do anything but think of saving their lives since then the case has been cited to me of the aged duchess de Villeroy, whose lady's maid possessing a small sum of money kept her alive on the way by a daily expenditure of ten sous the children were crying with hunger in lamentable fashion in fact i never saw anything more pitiful the king of sardinia ordered these unfortunates to be housed and fed but there was not room for all madame also did much to succour them we went all over the town accompanied by her equerry seeking lodgings and victuals for the poor wretches without being able to find as many of either as were wanted never shall i forget the impression made upon me by an old soldier decorated with the cross of saint louis who might have been almost sixty-five years old he was a fine man with a noble mane supporting himself against the curbstone at the corner of a lonely street he accosted nobody and asked for nothing i believe he would rather have died of hunger than beg but the profound unhappiness imprinted on his face compelled interest at first sight we went straight to him giving him a little money that remained to us and he thanked us with sobs in his throat the next day he was lodged in the king's palace as several other refugees were for there was no more room in the town it may well be imagined that i abandoned the plan of going to paris i decided to leave for vienna instead vienna is of considerable extent if you count its thirty-two suburbs it is full of very fine palaces the imperial museum boasts pictures by the greatest masters and i often went to admire them as well as those belonging to prince lichtenstein his gallery comprises seven rooms of which one contains only pictures by van dyck and the others some fine titians caravaggios rubens canalettos and so on there are also several masterpieces by the last named painter in the imperial museum it has been said with truth that the praetor is one of the best promenades in existence it is a long magnificent avenue in which large numbers of elegant carriages drive up and down and which is lined on either side by sitting spectators just as in the great avenue of the tuileries but what renders the praetor more pleasant and more picturesque is that the avenue leads to a wood which is not very thick and full of deer so tame that one can approach them without frightening them there is another promenade on the bank of the danube where every sunday various companies of the middle classes meet together to eat fried chicken the park of schoenbrunn is also well frequented especially on sundays its broad avenues and the pretty resting places on the heights at the end of the park make it very pleasant for walking in in vienna i went to several balls especially to those given by the russian ambassador count rasomovsky they danced the waltz there with such fury that i could not imagine how all these people spinning round at such a rate did not fall down from giddiness but men and women were so accustomed to this violent exercise that they never rested a single moment while a ball lasted the polonaise was often danced too and was much less fatiguing for this dance is nothing more than a procession in which you quietly walk two by two it suits pretty women to perfection 
as there is time to look their faces and figures all over. I also wanted to see a great court ball. I was invited to one. The Emperor Francis II had taken for his second wife Maria Theresa of the Two Sicilies, daughter to the Queen of Naples. I had painted this princess in 1792, but I found her so changed on meeting her at this ball that I had difficulty in recognizing her. Her nose had lengthened, and her cheeks had sunk so much that she resembled her father. I was sorry for her sake that she had not kept her mother's features, who reminded me strongly of our charming Queen of France. A person whose friendship I had great pleasure in renewing at Vienna was the Comtesse de Brion, Princess de Laurent. She had been most kind to me in my early youth, and I resumed the agreeable habit of supping at her house, where I often met the valiant Prince Nassau, so formidable in a fight, so gentle and modest in a salon. I also made frequent visits at the house of the Comtesse de Rombec, sister of Comte Cobenzel. The Comtesse de Rombec gathered about her the most distinguished society of Vienna. It was under her roof that I saw Prince Metternich and his son, who has since become Prime Minister, and who was then nothing but a very handsome young man. I there met again the amiable Prince de Ligné. He told us about the delightful journey he had made in the Crimea with the Empress Catherine II, and inspired me with a wish to see that great ruler. In the same house I encountered the Duchess de Guichy, whose lovely face had not changed in the least. Her mother, the Duchess de Polignac, lived permanently at a place near Vienna. It was there that she heard of the death of Louis the Sixteenth, which affected her health very seriously. But when she heard the dreadful news of the Queen's death, she succumbed altogether. Her grief changed her to such an extent that her pretty face became unrecognizable, and everyone foresaw that she had not much longer to live. She did in fact die in a little while, leaving her family and some friends who would not leave her disconsolate at their loss. I can judge how terrible that which had happened in France must have been to her by the sorrow I experienced myself. I learned nothing from the newspapers, for I had read them no more since the day when, having opened one at Madame de Rombec's, I had found the names of nine persons of my acquaintance who had been guillotined. People even took care to hide all political pamphlets from me. I thus heard of the horrible occurrence through my brother, who wrote it down and sent the letter without giving any further particulars whatever. His heart broken, he simply wrote that Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette had perished on the scaffold. Afterward, from compassion toward myself, I always abstained from putting the least question concerning what accompanied or preceded that awful murder, so that I should have known nothing about it to this very day, had it not been for a certain fact to which I may possibly refer in the future. As soon as spring came, I took a little house in a village near Vienna, and went to settle there. This village, called Witzing, was adjacent to the park of Schoenbrunn. I took with me to Witzing the large portrait I was then doing of the Princess Lichtenstein, to finish it. This young princess was very well built. Her pretty face had a sweet, angelic expression, which gave me the idea of representing her as Iris. I painted her standing, as if about to fly into the air. She had about her a fluttering, rainbow-colored scarf. Of course, I painted her with naked feet. But when the picture was hung in her husband's gallery, the heads of the family were greatly scandalized at seeing the princess exhibited without shoes and the prince told me that he had had a pair of nice little slippers placed under the portrait, which slippers, so he had informed the grandparents, had slipped off her feet and fallen on the ground. At Vienna I was as happy as anyone possibly could be away from her kin and country. In the winter the city offered one of the most agreeable and brilliant societies of Europe, and when the fine weather returned I delightedly sought my little country retreat. Not thinking of leaving Austria before I could safely return to France, the Russian ambassador and some of his compatriots urged me strongly to go to St. Petersburg, where, they assured me, 
the empress would be pleased to see me everything that the prince de ligny had told me about catherine the second inspired me with an irrepressible desire to get a glance at that potentate moreover i reasoned correctly that even a short stay in russia would complete the fortune i had decided to make before resuming residence in paris so i made up my mind to go after a sojourn at vienna of two years and a half i left that place in april of the year seventeen ninety five for prague i then passed on to budweiss whose surroundings are most engaging the town is deserted the fortifications are in ruins there are only old men and some women and children to be met with and not many of those finally we reached dresden by a very narrow road skirting the elba at a great height the river flowing through a broad valley the very next day after my arrival i visited the famous dresden gallery unexcelled in the world its masterpieces are so well known that i render no special account i will only observe that here as everywhere else one recognizes how far raphael stands above all other painters i had inspected several rooms of the gallery when i found myself before a picture which filled me with an admiration greater than anything else in the art of painting could have evoked it represents the virgin standing on some clouds and holding the infant jesus in her arms this figure is of a beauty and a nobility worthy of the divine brush that traced it the face of the child bears an expression at once innocent and heavenly the draperies are most accurately drawn and their coloring is exquisite at the right of the virgin is a saint done with admirable fidelity to life his two hands especially to be noted at the left is a young saint with head inclined looking at two angels at the bottom of the picture her face is all loveliness truth and modesty the two little angels are leaning on their hands their eyes raised to the persons above them and their heads are done with an ingenuity and a delicacy not to be conveyed in words being in great haste to get to st petersburg i went from dresden to berlin where i only remained five days my project being to return thither and make a longer stay on my way back from russia for the purpose of seeing prussia's charming queen end of section six recording by james k white chula vista chapter seven of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 7. St. Petersburg. I entered St. Petersburg on the 25th of July, 1795, by the road from Peterhof, which gave me a favorable idea of the city, for this road is lined on both sides by delightful country houses with gardens of the best taste in the english style there residents have taken advantage of the soil which is very marshy to adorn the gardens where there are kiosks and pretty bridges by canals and little streams but it is a pity that a dreadful dampness spoils this pleasant scene of an evening even before sunset such a fog rises over the road that one seems to be enveloped in thick dark smoke magnificent as i had conceived the city to be i was enchanted by the aspect of its monuments its handsome mansions and its broad streets one of which called the prospect is a mile long the neva clear and limpid cuts through the town laden with vessels and barks unceasingly moving up and down and this greatly adds to the liveliness of the town the quays of the neva are of granite like those of the large canals dug through the town by catherine on one bank of the river are splendid edifices the academy of arts the academy of sciences and a number of others are reflected in the neva 
there was no grander sight on a moonlight night i was told than the bulk of those majestic piles resembling ancient temples altogether st petersburg took me back to the times of agamemnon partly through the grandeur of the buildings and partly through the popular garb which reminded me of the dress of antiquity though i have just spoken of moonlight i was unable to enjoy it at the time of my arrival for in the month of july there is not a single hour of actual darkness in st petersburg the sun sets at about half past ten and it is merely dusk until twilight which begins half an hour after midnight so that one can always see plainly i have often supped at eleven o'clock by daylight my first care was to take a good rest for after riga the roads had been most horrible large stones one on top of the other gave my carriage which was one of the roughest in the world a violent shock at every moment and the inns being so bad as to exclude every possibility of staying at them we had jolted and jerked on to st petersburg without a stop i was far from recovered from all my fatigue since the term of my residence in st petersburg had been only twenty-four hours when a visitor was announced in the person of the french ambassador comte esterhazy he congratulated me on my arrival at st petersburg telling me that he was about to inform the empress of it and at the same time to take her orders for my presentation very little later i received a visit from the comte de choiseul gouffier while conversing with him i confessed what happiness it would give me to see the great catherine but i did not dissemble the fright and embarrassment i expected to undergo when i should be presented to that powerful princess you will find it quite easy he replied when you see the empress you will be surprised at her good nature she is really an excellent woman i acknowledged that i was astonished by his remark the justice of which i could scarcely believe in view of what i had heard up to that time it is true that the prince de Ligne, during the charming narration of his journey in the crimea had recounted several facts proving that this great princess had manners that were as gracious as they were simple but an excellent woman was hardly the thing to call her however the same evening comte esterhazy on returning from Zarskoichello, where the empress was living came to tell me that her majesty would receive me the next day at one o'clock such a quick presentation which i had not hoped for put me into a very awkward position i had nothing but very plain muslin dresses as i usually wore no others and it was impossible to have an ornamental gown made from one day to the next even at st petersburg comte esterhazy had said he would call for me at ten o'clock precisely and take me to breakfast with his wife who also lived at Zarskoichello, so that when the appointed hour struck i started with serious apprehensions about my dress which certainly was no court dress on arriving at madame de esterhazy's i in fact took note of her amazement her obliging civility did not prevent her from asking me have you not brought another gown i turned crimson at her question and explained how time had been wanting to have a more suitable gown made her displeased looks increased my anxiety to such a degree that i needed to summon up all my courage when the moment came to go before the empress the comte gave me his arm and we were walking across a portion of the park when at a ground-floor window i espied a young person who was watering a pot of pansies she was seventeen years old at most her features were well formed and regular her face a perfect oval her fine complexion was not bright but was of a paleness completely in harmony with the expression of her countenance whose sweetness was angelic her fair hair floated over her neck and forehead she was clad in a white tunic a carelessly knotted girdle surrounding a waist as slender and supple as a nymph's as i have described her so ravishingly did this young person stand out against the background of her apartment adorned with pillars and draped in pink and silver gauze that i exclaimed that is psyche it was princess elizabeth the wife of alexander she addressed me and kept me long enough to tell me a thousand flattering things she then added we have wanted you here for a long time madame lebrun 
so much so that I have sometimes dreamed you had already come. I parted from her with regret, and have always preserved a memory of that charming vision. A few minutes later I was alone with the autocrat of all the Russias. The ambassador had told me I must kiss her hand, in accordance with which custom she drew off one of her gloves, and this ought to have reminded me what to do, but I forgot all about it. The truth is that the sight of this famous woman made such an impression upon me that I could not possibly think of anything else but to look at her. I was at first extremely surprised to find her short. I had imagined her a great height, something like her renown. She was very stout, but still had a handsome face, which her white hair framed to perfection. Genius seemed to have its seat on her broad, high forehead. Her eyes were soft and small, her nose was quite Greek, her complexion lively, and her features very mobile. She at once said in a voice that was soft, though rather thick, I am delighted, madame, to see you here. Your reputation had preceded you. I am fond of the arts, and especially of painting. I am not an adept, but a fancier. Everything else she said during this interview, which was rather long, in reference to her wish that I might like Russia well enough to remain a long time, bore the stamp of such great amiability that my shyness vanished, and by the time I took leave of Her Majesty I was entirely reassured. Only I could not forgive myself for not having kissed her hand, which was very beautiful and very white and I deplored that oversight the more as Count Esterhazy reproached me with it. As for what I was wearing, she did not seem to have paid the least attention to it, or else perhaps she may have been easier to please than our ambassadress. I went over part of the gardens at Zarskoicello, which are a veritable little fairyland. The Empress had a terrace from them communicating with her apartment, and on this terrace she kept a large number of birds. I was told that every morning she went out to feed them, and that this was one of her chief pleasures. Directly after my audience, Her Majesty testified her wish to have me spend the summer in that beautiful region. She commanded her stewards, of whom the old Prince Beriatinsky was one, to give me an apartment in the castle, as she desired to have me near her, so that she might see me paint but I afterward found out that these gentlemen took no pains to put me near the Empress, and that, in spite of her repeated orders, they always maintained that they had no lodgings at their disposal. What astonished me most of all, when I was informed of this matter, was that these courtiers, suspecting me to belong to the party of the Comte d'Artois, were afraid lest I had come to get Esterhazy replaced by another ambassador. It is probable that the Comte was in connivance with them about all this. But anybody was surely little acquainted with me who did not know that I was too busy with my art to give any time to politics, even if I had not always felt an aversion to everything smacking of intrigue. Moreover, aside from the honor of being lodged with the Empress and the pleasure of inhabiting such a fine place, everything would have been stiff and irksome for me at Zarkoistjelo. I have always had the greatest need to enjoy my liberty, and for the sake of following my own inclination I have always infinitely preferred living in my own house. Moreover, the reception I met with in Russia was well calculated to console me for a petty court intrigue. I cannot say how eagerly and with what kind-hearted affability a stranger is sought after in this country, especially if possessing some talent. My letters of introduction became quite superfluous. Not only was I at once invited to live with the best and pleasantest families, but I found several former acquaintances in St. Petersburg, and even some old friends. First, there was Count Stroganov, a true lover of the arts, whose portrait I had painted at Paris in my early youth. It was to us both an extreme pleasure to meet once more. He owned a splendid collection of pictures in St. Petersburg, and near the town at Kaminostrov, a delightful Italian villa, where he gave a great dinner every Sunday. He called for me to take me there, and I was enraptured with the place. The villa stood by the high road, 
and its windows overlooked the neva the garden whose boundaries were immense was laid out in the english manner a number of boats arrived from all directions bringing visitors to count stroganov's for a number of people who were not invited to dinner came to walk in the park the count also allowed merchants to set up their stalls there so that this beautiful place was enlivened with an amusing fair especially as the costumes of the different neighboring districts were picturesque and varied about three o'clock we went up on a covered terrace lined with pillars bright daylight falling between them from every side on one hand we enjoyed the view of the park and on the other that of the neva covered with a thousand boats the weather was the finest in the world for the summers are splendid in russia a country that in july i have often found hotter than italy we dined on this same terrace and the dinner was magnificent at dessert gorgeous fruits were served and remarkably fine melons which seemed to me a great luxury as soon as we sat down at table delightful instrumental music was heard and continued throughout the dinner the overture to iphigenia was executed entrancingly i was greatly surprised when count stroganov informed me that each of the musicians played but one note it was impossible for me to conceive how all these individual sounds could form into such a perfect whole and how any expression could grow out of such a mechanical performance after dinner we took a delightful walk in the park then toward evening we went back to the terrace whence at nightfall we witnessed a very fine display of fireworks which the count had had in store for us reflected in the waters of the neva these fireworks were of beautiful effect finally by way of concluding the pleasures of the day there arrived in two very narrow little boats some indians who danced before us their dances consisted in going through light movements without stirring from their places and entertained us considerably count stroganoff's house was far from being the only one kept with such splendor at st petersburg as at moscow a number of noblemen owning enormous fortunes were in the habit of setting an open table so that a well-recommended stranger was never under the necessity of having recourse to an inn there was a dinner or a supper everywhere nothing was embarrassing but your choice i remember toward the end of my stay in st petersburg how prince narishkin the grand equerry always held open table to the extent of twenty-five or thirty covers for strangers who were recommended to him these hospitable customs exist in the interior of russia whither modern civilization has not yet penetrated when russian noblemen go upon visits to their estates which are usually situated at great distances from the capital they stop on the way in the houses of their countrymen where without being personally known by the host they their servants and their horses are taken in and treated as handsomely as possible even should they remain a month i once saw a traveller who had journeyed across this vast country with two friends all three had traversed those distant provinces as they might have done during the golden age in the days of the patriarchs they had everywhere been lodged and fed with such liberality that their purses had become almost useless they had not been able to so much as force drink money on the people who had waited upon them and cared for their horses their hosts who for the most part were traders or husbandmen had expressed astonishment at the warmth of their gratitude if we were in your country said they you would do the same for us i only wish this had been true the summer ends in russia with the month of august and there is no autumn i often went walking at Tsarskoichello, whose park bounded by the sea is one of the loveliest sights imaginable it is full of monuments which the empress was wont to call her caprices there are a superb marble bridge in the palladian style turkish baths trophies of romazov's and orloff's victories a temple with thirty-two pillars and then the colonnade and the great stairway of hercules 
the park has unrivalled avenues of trees opposite the castle is a long broad lawn and at the end of it a cherry orchard where i remember having frequently eaten excellent cherries comte cobenzel very much wished me to make the acquaintance of a woman whose cleverness and beauty i had often heard vaunted the princess dolgoruki i received an invitation from her to dine at alexandrovsky where she had a country house and the comte came for me to take me there with my daughter this very large house was furnished without ostentation and it was a great pleasure to me to watch the continual passage of the boats in which the rowers sang in chorus the songs of the russian people have a somewhat barbarous originality but are melancholy and melodious the beauty of princess dolgoruki struck me very much her features had the greek character mixed with something jewish especially in profile her long dark chestnut hair carelessly taken up touched her shoulders her figure was perfect and in her whole person she exhibited at once nobility and grace without the least affectation she received me with so much amiability and civility that i willingly acceded to her request that i might stay a week with her the charming princess kurakin whose acquaintance i had made was living with the princess dolgoruki these ladies and comte cobenzel keeping house together the company was very numerous and no one thought of anything but amusement after dinner we took delightful rides in handsome boats furnished with red velvet gold fringed curtains a choir preceding us in a plainer boat charmed us with their singing which was always perfectly exact even at the highest notes the day of my arrival we had music in the evening the next day there was a delightful play dalarac's underground was given princess dolgoruki played the part of camille young de la ribaussier who afterward became minister in russia played the boy and comte cobenzel the gardener i remember how during the performance a messenger arrived from vienna with dispatches for the comte who was austrian ambassador at st petersburg and how at the sight of the man dressed as a gardener he did not want to give up the dispatches this giving rise to a most diverting argument between them behind the scenes at the end of the week the whole of which had seemed to last but a minute i was obliged to my regret to leave the hospitable roof of princess dolgoruki as i had made a number of engagements to paint portraits i however formed several connections at alexandrovsky which proved infinitely agreeable during my whole stay in russia comte cobenzel was passionately devoted to the princess dolgoruki without her responding in the least to his importunities but the coolness she showed toward his intentions by no means drove him away his sole object was the happiness of being in her presence whether in the country or in town he scarcely ever left her for a moment so soon as his dispatches written with great facility were sent off he rushed to her side and made a complete slave of himself he was seen to fly at the least word the least gesture of his divinity if a play was given he took any part she offered him even if the role was not at all suited to his appearance for comte cobenzel who looked about fifty was very ugly and squinted horribly he was rather tall but also extremely fat which however did not prevent him from being quite active particularly when it was a case of executing the demands of his dearly beloved princess otherwise he was quick and clever his conversation was enlivened with a thousand anecdotes which he could recount to perfection and i always knew him as the best and most obliging of men what made the princess dolgoruki indifferent to the size of comte cobenzel and to those of many other admirers was the fact that from one of them she had received attentions more brilliant than ever woman had had lavished upon her by any lovelorn king the famous potemkin he who had said the word impossible should be ruled out of the dictionary had testified his adoration for her with a magnificence 
surpassing all that we read of in the thousand and one nights when in 1791 after making her journey in the crimea the empress catherine the second returned to st petersburg prince potemkin remained behind in command of the army several of the generals having brought their wives it was then that he had occasion to meet princess dolgoruki her name too was catherine and the prince made a great banquet for her nominally in honor of the empress at table the princess was seated by his side at dessert on the table were put crystal goblets full of diamonds which were served to the ladies by the spoonful the queen of the festival observing this luxury potemkin whispered to her since this celebration is for you why should you be astonished at anything he would spare no sacrifice to satisfy a wish or a whim of that charming woman learning one day that she was in want of ball slippers of a kind she usually sent for to france potemkin dispatched an express messenger to paris who hastened day and night to bring back these slippers it was well known in st petersburg that to afford the princess dolgoruki a spectacle he much desired her to see he had assaulted the fortress of ochakov sooner than had been agreed upon and perhaps sooner than was prudent no woman it seems to me had greater dignity of mien and manner than princess dolgoruki having seen my sibyl about which she was very enthusiastic she wished me to make her portrait in this style and i had the pleasure of doing her bidding to her entire satisfaction the portrait done she sent me a very handsome carriage and put on my arm a bracelet made of a tress of her hair with a diamond inscription reading adorn her who adorns her century i was deeply touched by the graciousness and delicacy of such a gift at the time of my reaching st petersburg prince potemkin had already been there some years but he was still spoken of as though he had been a wizard some idea of what an extraordinary and high-flying imagination he had may be obtained from reading what the prince de Ligne and the comte de segur have written about the journey he arranged for the empress catherine the second in the crimea those palaces those wooden villages built all along the route as if by a magic wand that huge forest going up in flames by way of fireworks for her majesty the whole journey in fact was a fantastic affair his niece countess skavronska said to me in vienna had my uncle known you he would have loaded you with distinctions and riches certain it is that at every opportunity this famous man was generous to prodigality and luxurious to madness all his tastes were extravagant all his habits royal so much so that although he possessed a fortune exceeding that of some sovereigns the prince de ligne told me that he had known him to be without money favor and power had accustomed prince potemkin to satisfy his slightest desires here is an example which proves the point one day when the talk ran on the size of one of his adjutants he declared that a certain officer in the russian army whom he named was taller still after everyone who knew the officer in question had contradicted potemkin he forthwith sent off a messenger with an order to bring back with him this officer who was then eight hundred miles away upon hearing that he had been sent for by the prince his joy was unbounded since he believed that he had been promoted to a higher rank his disappointment may therefore be imagined when on his arrival in camp he was informed that he was to be measured with potemkin's adjutant and that he must then return without any other reward than the fatigue of the long journey the man whom a long period of favor had so to say accustomed to reign beside the sovereign was unable to survive the thought of disgrace catherine the second sent to prince repnin her orders to treat for peace to which potemkin was strongly opposed angry as possible he set out upon the instant in hope of preventing the signature but only to learn at yassi that peace was concluded this news was fatal to him already indisposed he now fell mortally ill which did not hinder him from at once beginning the return journey to st petersburg 
but in a few hours his ailment grew so serious that it became out of the question for him to support the movement of a carriage he was laid out in a meadow and covered with his cloak and there potemkin breathed his last sigh on the fifteenth of october seventeen ninety one in the arms of countess bronica his niece plato zuboff a young lieutenant of the guard succeeded potemkin in the favour of the empress who showered honours and wealth upon him end of chapter seven recording by james k white chula vista